All right, look, I'm going to just talk briefly about the background of IBS and in particular focus on IBS with diarrhea. And I'm going to try and convince you that there's accumulating evidence that at least a subset of these patients have organic disease. And I think that's a really interesting paradigm shift in our thinking. So we've gone from this, this disorder, these disorders being thought of as purely functional or purely brain-gut disorders, and we're starting to appreciate there are subsets, it's not one disease, and there are mechanisms that look promising and probably will lead to, in the long term, even more treatment options for our patients. So I'll take you through this, and hopefully it'll be somewhat instructive. So what's the first uh, piece of information? Well, I guess epidemiology is important. This is a common problem in the United States and in the rest of the world. Wherever you look in the world, you'll find IBS. So this is a condition that affects humanity really across the globe. In the United States, the pooled prevalence is about 12%. That means at least one in 10 Americans have classic IBS. Many do not consult. If you are one of the people who does not have IBS yet, you still might get it. Yes, you might. Although you're more likely to do so if you're younger than if you're older, for example. So it's a very interesting syndrome, but it's clearly a very common condition. Women are more affected than men for reasons that remain somewhat unclear, although there is some speculation about possible mechanisms. IBS significantly impacts on people. That's why it's important and why it's important to manage. And it's a costly disorder because of consultations, because of testing, and because of drug therapy and other therapies that people need. So it's a common, costly disorder. Like other common conditions, it significantly impacts on quality of life. This is the uh, SF36, and basically it's a quality of life measure showing that IBS and migraine and asthma, they impact on certain aspects of quality of life, um, and indeed IBS is as significant as other common chronic conditions that affect uh, many people in the United States and around the globe. The care for IBS also varies very widely, which is interesting. There's a variation in investigations, for example, that are performed. Uh, I think this emphasises the fact that investigation needs to be thought about carefully. And one could argue with this much variation, actually there's uh, some underservicing and probably some overservicing in terms of testing. So I think that's just important to recognise. And we'll talk about what testing we would recommend and we can certainly discuss and debate with you how far to go in the investigative algorithm. And I think that's important information for you to have. Now, this is the Rome 4 definition for IBS. Literally, it was published this week. It is slightly different to Rome 3, but let me emphasise what you need to know. So these criteria are meant to help you make a positive diagnosis of IBS. So you must, you must have abdominal pain as one of the key features. If you don't have abdominal pain, you don't have IBS, according to the Rome definition. And that is very important to recognise. There are other functional syndromes that are not IBS, where there's bowel dysfunction or bloating, for example, but without abdominal pain. That's not IBS. And the treatment of those conditions is potentially different. So I think that's really important to emphasise. There's a symptom threshold here, one day per week for the last three months. Then you've got to have two or more of associated features where there's a relationship between the abdominal pain and bowel dysfunction. 
If there's no relationship between abdominal pain and bowel dysfunction, they do not have IBS. So again, for a positive diagnosis, you need to have two of the three features on the slide. The pain needs to be either relieved or even worsened by having a bowel movement, by defecation. That's an absolute classic symptom. And the worsening is one of the changes in Rome 4. In Rome 3, it was just about relief with defecation. In Rome 4, it's relief or worsening. And or a change in the frequency of stool and or a change in the appearance or the stool form, whether it's looser or harder, you need to have two of the three features in the purple circles, or you can have all three, of course, to have IBS according to the Rome criteria. If you fulfill this definition in clinical practice with no red flags, no weight loss, no vomiting, uh, no other features that suggest to you something serious is going on, you're very likely to have IBS. You don't need to do many, if any, tests. And I think that's really important. This is just showing you the Bristol stool form scale. This is invented by the British. Only the British would invent a scale <laughs> to measure stool form, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, you have to be obsessive enough to do this. <laughs> But that's what they did, and we do use this in research and sometimes in practice, actually. But this correlates with transit time. So if your stools are loose, you've got faster colonic transit. If your stools are very hard and difficult to pass, potentially, you tend to have slow colonic transit, and it's a good correlation. So actually, it's a physiological test, and you don't have to ask the patient to tell you. You can look yourself. It's a physical sign, ladies and gentlemen. Thrilling, isn't it, to think about? <laughs> you may not want to do that, but you can do it, and it is objective. So I think that's important to recognise. Now, what's the pathophysiology? I think the first thing to say is this. This is probably several diseases. This is not one condition. So IBS is divided into diarrhoea predominant, constipation predominant or mixed pattern, diarrhea and constipation. We're focusing on diarrhea predominant tonight just to make it simple, but it's not totally simple. But even just focusing on diarrhea, there are probably several disease groups within the syndrome. So I think it's really important to recognise. Now, the classical story about IBS is you're genetically predisposed. You might get acute gastroenteritis, and then you can develop IBS. The gut is extra sensitive, it's hypersensitive. The gut motility is abnormal. And then you get symptoms, and basically that's where you are. But I'm going to show you that it's probably a little bit more complex than that. So first of all, I want to say we know genetics are important. It's really exciting, actually. Probably genes are relevant, although exactly which genes are relevant we need to learn about. And environment matters too, even early, early life. So if you're born with a low birth weight, you're at higher risk of IBS. And it doesn't have to be very low, by the way. So that really suggests perhaps there's a neuronal development problem in some people with IBS. There's even a mutation that's been linked to IBS. And actually, this may explain 2% of IBS. And this is the uh, sodium channel gene. This is the Brugada gene, actually. You know what Brugada syndrome is. This is the Brugada gene complex. But actually, they don't have, they don't have the Brugada syndrome, interestingly. But they do get IBS, and it's potentially reversible with pharmacologic therapy. So there's one mechanism that leads to IBS that's clearly organic, and we tend to mix it all up with all the other causes of IBS. And that's not a routine test that's available right now, and uh, I guess that's something to think about, but it's a really interesting issue. And then we know that some people with IBS have excess bacteria in their bowel, uh, in their intestine. They also can have increased permeability, they can get 
dysregulation of the immune system and they can get mast cell infiltration, some people, and they can get a cytokine response from the inflammatory insult. This is IBS. This is not IBD, although it looks like it could actually be akin to some of the mechanisms that go awry in inflammatory bowel disease. So these people have a very subtle inflammation, but it's really important to recognise this subset. And the bacteria may be critically important in driving some of this change. If you get an infection, you can develop IBS, and here's uh, basically a study which shows uh, the risks of getting uh, post-infectious IBS and what happens to people over time. And basically, uh, there's a significant risk of post-infectious IBS after acute gastroenteritis, particularly if you get a severe infection, particularly if you've already got pre-morbid anxiety or depression. In other words, um, certain conditions may set the bowel up for the syndrome to develop, and I think that's important. I mentioned the excess bacteria, but they don't have classic SIBO. They don't have classic small uh, intestinal bacterial overgrowth. They tend to have an excess of bacteria, but it's not at the very high levels you see with classic SIBO. And I think that's important to recognise as well. And I mentioned the subtle inflammation, and you can do cell counts, for example, in patients who've had a post-infectious IBS, and you can show certain lymphocyte numbers are increased, for example, over controls, and you can show that enteroendocrine cells, these are cells that release serotonin, they're also abnormal uh, in a subset with particularly post-infectious IBS. So that's also relevant to know. And I mentioned mast cells, just to show you there is an increase in a subset of these patients of the mast cell, and obviously <coughs> mast cells are very active cells that communicate with the gut and the brain and can drive inflammation as well as uh, other responses. And then finally, cytokines are increased in IBS, and what's really interesting about this is the cytokines are associated with anxiety in IBS, according to some studies. In other words, some people with IBS may become anxious from the gut changes that are occurring. It's not that they were always anxious. Some people may become anxious from the development of the IBS complex. So this is not a pure functional problem. This is, in some people, a real organic process. And I think patients like to hear that. Patients like to know that they're not all crazy. Now, I must say, occasionally, it's hard to uh, uh, be absolutely sure. But uh, honestly, I think patients need to be reassured. Their symptoms are real. Their symptoms are real. They have a real problem, and they deserve real attention. Not, oh, you've just got pain, forget about it, it's just IBS, who cares? And I hope that's the message that I've sold you. And that's just a, a summary of the mechanism, which I haven't got time to take you through yet again. All right. What about diagnosis? We'll talk about this more in the cases, but it's really important to recognise that positive IBS symptoms, Rome criteria, Lack of red flags, lack of alarm features, very reassuring, this is IBS. Um, many people will get a CBC, and that's uh, often recommended and recommended by Rome 4. Screening for celiac sprue depends on how common it is in your practice. If this is a common problem, at least 1% of your practice, then clearly you want to test, but otherwise you don't need to. Colonoscopy, great test, but it doesn't reassure IBS cases. A negative colonoscopy does not, does not reassure people. So that's really important to know. You do a colonoscopy to find something else, not to reassure people. Um, and I think that's really important to recognise. Now, what about treatment for this? 
I want to mention that diet has become popular, and we'll talk more about this in the cases, but diet changes the bugs. What you eat is what your bugs are. And if you change your diet, you change your bugs. And your bugs help keep you well or not well. So I think that's really important to recognise. You've probably heard of the low FODMAP diet, the fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides and polyols. Basically, this is taking foods out from the gut that feed the bugs, that feed them and make them or help them to produce gas. And in fact, if you reduce all of this, it's a miserable diet, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's a miserable diet. But if you take it all out, a lot of people get better. Not everybody, but certainly some. And in fact, um, there's one excellent trial that looked at the so-called traditional IBS diet, but in this randomised trial, about 50% get better, but the traditional diet worked well too, except in the traditional diet, they took out quite a few of the FODMAPs also. So it's a little bit hard to understand this trial. I show it as one of the randomised trials. There are other trials that show a low FODMAP diet versus a standard diet probably does work better, um, and I think there is evidence that's the case. Physical activity can help, ladies and gentlemen. So physical activity can be of value for IBS. There's only one study, but it did suggest this, and I recommend exercise as part of the approach to IBS, and I think it's important to do so. What about pharmacological therapies? I'm going to focus on IBSD, not the other subtypes, although we're happy to take questions, but let's go forward very quickly. I think it's fair to say first-line therapy is reasonable to start with something like loperamide, taking it to prevent diarrhoea, not after you've had a bowel movement. So taking it regularly. The only problem with this approach, it helps the diarrhoea often, it does not help the abdominal pain. It is no better than placebo for abdominal pain in IBS. Therefore, it really has some limitations. You can try a diphenoxylate atropine. Uh, I personally don't use this, uh, but it also probably, there's no trials, but probably similar uh, benefits uh, in terms of its approach. Some people try bile acid sequestrants because 10 to 20%, maybe up to 30 even, may have bile acid malabsorption with their diarrhoea. The problem with therapy here is a lot of patients don't like it terribly much when you try this approach. But I wanted to mention it as an option to consider, particularly in more difficult cases. <clears throat> Antidepressants, certainly these have been very commonly applied, particularly the tricyclics, because they are anticholinergic as well, Tricyclic slow gut transit, so that helps diarrhea. And low dose tricyclics are well tolerated. I'm talking about starting with 10 to 20 of amitriptyline or desipramine. Not FDA approved, but important, and we certainly use them as gastroenterologists, and the panel can attest to this very commonly in our practice. For women with severe IBS diarrhea, Women with severe IBS diarrhea, the FDA has approved a losatron. The evidence is uh, there are summarised on the slide. On dancitron's a cheaper option for some. Actually seems to be very well tolerated but doesn't help the pain. A losatron helps pain and diarrhea. On dancitron only helps the diarrhea according to the randomised data. Probiotics, um, yes, I use them. Uh, there are clinical trials that show a very modest benefit, and I think they're a great placebo. They're terrific. Um, you know, I, I think mostly a placebo, unfortunately. But I do use them, and we can talk about which type to use, uh, but the evidence is a little bit mixed. Anti-inflammatories have been disappointing. Mesalazine hasn't worked in IBS, and I just wanted to mention that. There are trials, but it really hasn't worked. So what's new on the market? We've talked about other drugs, but uh, there are two here that I want to briefly go through. Rifaximin is a non-absorbable antibiotic. It's well tolerated. Uh, it changes the natural history of IBS. So you give the drug for a period of time, say two weeks is uh, typically the uh, use, 
and then actually people will stay well, the responders will stay well, and it's about 40% responders, they'll stay well for months, sometimes longer. But most people, unfortunately, do relapse. And I think that uh, needs to be remembered for rifaximin. But a good drug, and I mentioned it changes the natural history. There's no other drug I know of. There's no other drug I know of that changes the natural history of IBS. And how does it work? We don't know. Okay? We don't <laughs> know. Probably it changes those bugs. But which ones exactly, I think, is unclear. And that's important to recognise. But it certainly does change the natural history. And I won't talk about retreatment, except to say you can retreat, but there are some limitations. And we'll come back to this in the case. Elox Eloxadoline for IBS diarrhoea is a new drug class, mixed mu opioid receptor agonist and the delta opioid receptor antagonist, uh, very low systemic absorption, and basically it's proven to be a useful drug. Um, certainly it's available now in practice, uh, and uh, the clinical trials show a clear benefit over placebo, about a 10% therapeutic gain, which is about what we see with most of the drugs that are FDA approved for IBS. So this is a symptom controlling drug, which is important to recognize. In terms of tolerability, it seems well tolerated, but you need to remember one fact about it. There's a very low rate of pancreatitis that's been reported, uh, and it's important and we should discuss this. There are some people where this drug is contraindicated and I think that's important. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a very quick overview of IBS and IBS diarrhea. Remember, you make a positive clinical diagnosis. That's how you reassure people. You tell people, I think you've got IBS. Even if you're gonna go and do some testing, making a positive diagnosis is one of the most important things that you can do in terms of the syndrome. Um, clearly, there's new evidence of mechanisms, and we've got new drugs that are starting to target some of those. Not all of them, but some of them. And I think that's really important to recognise. And remember the drugs that are FDA approved and reasonably recently been used are rifaximin, aloxadoline, and of course, elocitron that's been available for quite a long time.